Welcome to Intergeo TV studio at Intergeo 2018 in Frankfurt. Joining me is Dr. Georg Schroth, co-founder and general manager of Nevis. Thanks Hello, a lot. welcome. Thanks. BIM has really been taking off in the last few years. That's our topic today. But it's still mostly limited to the design phase. Why do you think adoption of BIM throughout the entire building life cycle has been slower? Yeah, I think BIM is like in its in its core, it's really about um, a single source of truth to have everyone working together and to collaborate. And I think we did a good job, or the industry has done a really good job around making that possible for the for the design and the planning phase, where CAD experts are sitting together with the architects, engineering teams, and collaborate and find a joint understanding of what they really want to do. Now, however, once we start building the construction, we are in the field, we have people that are not really CAD experts, and um, they basically, um, they, f they find the reality. And then they, um, there, is, there will be mistakes always, and there will be workarounds. But I have a hard time uh, believing that those people will update the BIM model um, with their mistakes, with their workarounds, to reflect the real state of the building. And um, so this leaves me, so to say, the point that it's still about collaboration, and it's still about um, a single source of truth, but maybe CAD drawings are not the right medium to do that. So we have to open ourselves a little bit towards that and not be limited to that view. And then um, if you look, so to say, at the phase where BIM could be yeah, at least as valuable and uh, generate a lot of money would be at the operation phase, where the facility managers come in. But today, they don't really have an as-built model, right? So there's nothing that they can rely on uh, because it's not as-built. And it's also a little bit complex for them uh, because they are not really CAD experts either. And I think at that point, we again have to look on how we can actually provide a medium that is reliable and easy to use for the facility managers. And once we open our mind and, and not constrain ourselves to CAD, I think we will see a lot of growth in that area. On the other hand, the benefits of BIM are becoming increasingly well known, but many buildings do not have BIM models yeah. if BIM was not part of the design phase yes. of building construction. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how can BIM be brought to existing buildings where BIM was not part of the design phase? Right, there's a lot of buildings obviously in the world that did not already start their construction with BIM, so all the existing buildings pretty much. And this is maybe the even larger market for us because a lot of renovations, reusage is happening. And at that point, well, you have to start with collecting the reality, right? It's, there's no way around this. Uh, and people have done this, right? They use laser scanners to do this. Um, however, the time and money required to do that, to map a whole building, it's all its detail, and that's what you need for BIM, is almost prohibitively expensive. So you, you'd rarely do this. And I think you have seen around today already a lot of systems that try to do this a lot faster than it was possible in the, f in the past. Um, and the key word is, of course, uh, inner mobile mapping systems here. Um, now, once, so to say, the capturing of the reality is done or can be done much more easier, the question is now about the modeling part, which is at least as time consuming and complex as the capturing. And uh, there's actually a question of whether we really need to model everything yeah, or whether maybe even a 2D model is good enough um, for a lot of things and then combining it together with um, the reality capture data directly. So making the reality capture data accessible without uh, massive GPUs and anything like that so that you can walk around as if you were there um, together with a 2D floor plan sounds to me like a very good solution to many stakeholders that can work together and collaborate. As a matter of fact, SAP and Archivas, like facility management providers, did already uh, integrate, for instance, with one of our products. Point clouds are a valuable source of building information, mm -hmm. but they are usually limited to professionals working with BIM models yeah. and building plans. What can be done to make point cloud data more consumer friendly and enable widespread adoption? Yeah, so I think point clouds are basically um, like the data that we acquire, not the data that we should give to everyone, right? Um, I don't provide people with individual measurements and everything like that. So people want to see, um, like they want to have uh, an idea of how the building is and like really is in every detail. And uh, But they don't want to go to the individual measurements, of course. And I think point clouds are just, so to say, an intermediary product to get to the realization or the imp like the the, 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 yeah, the data that the people should actually consume. So um, I think what, what can be done today already fairly easy is to have something like a virtual walkthrough where you can just walk as you were on site and not just fly like a plane or try to maneuver completely free in space. You can just walk through that space. And I think this is something that we also try to reflect uh, in, our, in our software, in our browser-based software. And um, the second part is about um, 
making that data accessible by being able to search on that data. And I think there will be a, a, quite a few things in the future that try to interpret the data and not just only have uh, geometry and, uh, and pictures, but also have um, yeah, metadata assigned to that that can be automatically generated. Another topic, mobile scanning. Yeah. It's key to scaling data yes. capture, but data accuracy is mm -hmm. an important consideration. What is SLAM, by the way? Yeah. And how is it being used to bridge this gap? Yeah, so mobile mapping in general is super important, as, uh, as you mentioned, to, to scale up and to be much faster in acquisition of the data. And I think we see more and more people being able to um, yeah, make use of this data. Um, however, so far, it really has been limited to the experts. Now, with mobile mapping systems, there is multiple different ways of mapping mobile. Um, but I think the one that is most advanced is the one that is based on SLAM, which is called simultaneous localization and mapping. And you can imagine it like, um, basically uh, an automated surveying uh, where you constantly look in your, in your environment with hundreds if not thousands of measurements point per second um, or actually hundreds of thousands of measurements point per second and constantly observing your environment. And the, in the moment you start doing this, you already have like a first, let's say, static laser scan. You did that. So you continue while you're moving, building multiple times, uh, like, a, like let's say 100 times per second, you're building these static laser scanners. And you match all of them together. And by doing that, you basically have an idea of how you have moved while you collected all those static laser scans. And by algorithms, you can now combine these individual scans together to a consolidated and very accurate map. So there has been a lot of improvement. A lot of companies have raised uh, that provide SLAM. And it is like the early days where laser scanning came in. And now it's about to differentiate what kind of SLAM are the people providing. And uh, the magic number here, so to say, is still missing, where so far it was just millimeters, or is it how accurate is it? What's the density? How many points per second? There, there's new numbers, so to say, in SLAM to compare them. One of the most important one is the amount of drift that you accumulate over a certain length. And I think to, grade, to surveying grade SLAM, you have to be in the range of less than 0.1% of drift. Means if you go 100 meters, um, the error has to be 0.1% of 100 meters of drift. And then you can still do loop closures and combine it with, um, with total stations to get an even higher accuracy, but that's kind of the level. Very, very few ca companies uh, are capable of doing that these days. And it's important for a surveyor to ask about these specific questions. What technology trends do you see emerging in indoor spatial intelligence over the next few years? Yeah, so I think there's two parts. First of all, uh, making um, this, this, this potential of reality capturing um, really accessible to everyone. So far, we are mapping gigantic data, fantastic data. In the end, we hand over a 2D floor plan. <laughs> that cannot be the result, right? That's not reflecting what the capabilities of all of us are. So we want to be able to transport this data to everyone. And our Indoviewer, for instance, is one product that gives the all stakeholders the accessibility or the access to this powerful data by just going in the browser and virtually walking through the site. So the accessibility is one part of this data, making people work together on reality data. The second part is certainly about um, extending the scope of, of mapping. And um, we will see a lot more mapping in the future. It's not only about having 2D floor plans. It's about collaboration in factories, on construction sites. Um, we see that a lot of momentum from um, factory providers that say, I want to have an up-to-date model of my factory to be able to plan what I have to change to improve efficiency. And here you don't map like once every two years, you map like once a month. And that obviously is only possible with uh, more scalable mapping systems. The third um, dimension that I see is that um, it's not only about um, the capture data, it's also about interpreting that data, analyzing this. Um, with the recent advances in AI algorithms, we are able today already to analyze these environments and to provide, let's say, a route or understand where, what, is, what kind of rooms do we have in this building without necessi necessity to annotate these things. So you can just query for that in our, in our tools. Finally, let's, uh, let's mm -hmm. have a look on your company, Navis. Yep. What technology has Navis developed to support the yep. widespread adoption mm. of indoor spatial intelligence? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, I think the M6 is a really, um, a really amazing product uh, because we, we really brought the SLAM technology now to the surveying level. So before, um, we had given a lot on, on improving the SLAM incrementally, but now we have made a really big step so that you can map on any terrain or any surface in 6D, that's six degrees of freedom, and go over cobblestone, ramps, anything like that. And of course, this extends the amount of uh, use cases that you can apply mobile mapping to a lot. And at the same time, you provide the surveying greater accuracy. Now, with the Indo Viewer this year, we are launching uh, a new version that allows you to bring any one scan data inside a browser-based tool to make this accessible to all the stakeholders. So in terms, let's go back to this digital factory example. They will scan with an M6, but they also scan or already have scanned with a Faro, Leica, whatever the product might be. And now you bring all this data together and allow the people to discuss certain issues that is done on real, up-to-date, and detailed data. And that uh, enables really true collaboration. So thanks a lot and have a successful time at Intergeo. Thank you so much.